All of us have to deal with the fact that sooner or later, life throws problems our way that we didn't ask for. And it's important to understand that every problem that, that comes our way falls into one of three categories. Number one, those are problems that we, we have control over. And then secondly, there are problems that we can influence, don't have control over, over them, but, but we can influence. And normally, those problems are relational. Can't control the problem, but we can have influence through the words we speak or the, the actions that we, that we do. But then there's a third category, and that is those problems over which we have neither. We have neither control nor we have no influence. I begin in your notes with two introductory statements. The first one is this. Number one, regardless of what life throws my way, there is always one thing I can influence and control, and that is my response. You see, what really matters is what happens in us, not to us. When problems come our way, what matters is what happens inside of us, not what happens to us. I put in your notes, the issue is not the problem. That's not the problem. The issue is not the problem, but how I handle the problem. Now, with that in mind, I want you to open your Bibles to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. And we are going to deal with today uh, one of the most heart-wrenching and honestly tear-jerking stories in all of the Bible. It's about a lady by the name of Hannah. She's married. But she is faced with a set of circumstances that are they're almost beyond something that one can imagine. However, as we go through this, there are lessons that we can learn when we face problems that seemingly are about to bury us. You know, they say that a dense fog that can cover seven city blocks a hundred feet deep is composed of an eight, eight ounce glass of water, just an eight ounce glass of water that has been divided into 60 million droplets. That's right. <laughs> Only one eight ounce glass of water can stop the world's busiest airport in its tracks, can, can cause a, a 70 car pileup on a, on, a, on a busy interstate. And that leads me to the second introductory statement, and that is, oftentimes, it's not the big things, but rather the small things that give us so much trouble. It's at times those small things that just knock us for a loop Physically, emotionally, mentally, and yes, even spiritually. So I want us this morning, I want us to look at this lady, Hannah. And we're going to see how to properly deal with problems that come our way. Problems that, that we think, man, am I ever going to get over this problem? How am I going to deal with this? So let's look at Hannah's life. And the first thing I want you to see, number one, the problem is clearly defined. What was Hannah's problem? Verse number five clearly describes her problem. The Bible says the Lord had closed her womb. And let me say two things about that. Number one, this problem, the fact that the Lord had closed her womb, it affected her Physically, that, that term means barrenness. It's talking about a, a lady that's, that's barren, physically unable to have children. Physically, the womb is unproductive. Now, as you study the Bible, you find out that Hannah 
Hannah was a woman that was deserving of, of motherhood. Uh, and yet this physical condition prevented her from having a child. It affected her physically, but secondly, it affected her spiritually. We're specifically told that Hannah's condition was permitted by the Lord. The Bible says the Lord had closed her womb. You know, Hannah is one of three women in the Bible that uh, were barren. Sarah in Genesis chapter 16, uh, Rebecca, Isaac's wife in Genesis chapter 23, and Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1. There's only four women in all the Bible that uh, the Bible said that they were barren at, at, at a specific time. I put in your notes. Why this is so important is this. In those days when a woman was barren, it was looked upon as a sign of God's displeasure or disapproval. In other words, when a lady was barren, married and couldn't have children, uh, people looked at her and, and they, they looked at her life and they viewed her life as a life that was not right with God. And Hannah, Hannah was, get the picture here, Hannah was confronted by the worst of both worlds. If it wasn't enough that she was caring about this load of being physically uh, incapable of having a, a child, she was dealing with what others were saying about her spiritually because she was barren. I put in your notes because I want you to see the intensity of Hannah's problems. And to get an idea of the intensity of her problem, there are seven Hebrew words that God uses to describe the pain that Hannah had. And I put them in your notes. The first one, provoked. God used the word provoked. You see that twice in verse 6 and in verse 7. Number two, miserable. In verse 6. Number three, three times God uses the word weep or wept. Number four, grieved. Number five, bitterness of soul. Number six, affliction. And number seven, sorrowful spirit. A sorrowful spirit. You see that in verse number 15. Just look at those words, provoked, miserable, weeped, grieved, bitterness of soul, affliction, sorrowful spirit. I mean, what she was dealing with wasn't just a minor incident. This thing could destroy an individual. In fact, I put in your notes, Hannah's bitterness of soul placed her in elite company. Job 10.1 describes the effect of Job's suffering. The Bible says that Job, all he went through, he had a bitterness of soul. So it's safe to say that Hannah's problems, I mean, she was overwhelmed with problems. But if that's not enough, number two, let's look at the personal attacks she faced. Look at verse number 2 of 1 Samuel 1. And he had two wives. That's Elkanah. That's the wife of, of, uh, of, of Hannah. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah and the name of the other, Panine. Panine had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, Elkanah had two wives, but there was something special that he saw in Hannah, verse number five, or excuse me, verse number four. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penene, Penene, Penene uh, his wife, and to all her, all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. Now, I'm confident of one thing. I'm confident that this left a, 
a bad taste in Panini's mouth. And the reality is she became a thorn in the side of Hannah. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me give you two things right here. Number one, Hannah was criticized. She was criticized. Look at verse 6. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. Panine specifically referred to, she's referred to as, as Hannah's adversary. Uh, and, I mean, she's not handling it handling it very, very well. And I mean, she showed what, what Elkanah was showing uh, Hannah. I mean, the Bible says that we're told that, that she provoked Hannah severely. And that word provoked is interesting. Just listen. The word provoked in verse number six is used to describe an animal that would, pre, that would prey on its enemy or victim. And that's exactly what's happening to Hannah. Her enemy, Panine, is using condemnation and criticism in an attempt to, to literally destroy Hannah. Now, Panine had children, but Hannah did not. And she, so she uses this as leverage against Hannah. No doubt that every time she saw Hannah, She'd say, well, so I have children, and you don't have children. God has blessed me more. God has smiled on me, but he's frowned on you, Hannah. And so Hannah faced this, this painful criticism from Panine. You ever faced any criticism like that? Someone that, if you be honest, you, you couldn't stand to be around? Because every time when you would leave the room, you knew that they were going to start talking about you and criticizing you. Winston Churchill was a man of incredible integrity and respect in the face of opposition as he led the nation of England. In his last year in office, he was at an official ceremony, and a few rows behind him, there were these two men that were talking about him. One of them said, uh, oh, they say that, uh, speaking of Churchill, he said, uh, well, they say he's, uh, he's getting senile. The other one said that, uh, oh, they should, that he should step aside and leave the nation uh, to uh, someone more dynamic and, and a more capable individual. And Winston Churchill turned around and said, gentlemen, they say he's deaf also. There's a story told, uh, Dwight L. Moody wrote about this, that he was in one of his, he was a great evangelist, and in one of his meetings, uh, he received a note. And the note just had only one word, and the word was fool. And Dwight L. Moody got up the next night in the service and said, you know, folks, I've gotten many notes without signatures, but this is the first time I ever, I ever got one where someone forgot to write the note and only signed their name. I put in your, your notes in that box. If you are living for Christ, you can expect folks to criticize. Now watch this, folks. But you ought to live so nobody will believe them. But I want to tell you that even if you live for Christ, you're probably going to have some individuals that intersect your life and they lie in bed at night and just thinking of ways that, uh, things that they can criticize you for. I mean, can you imagine the pain that Panine brought to Hannah? But it was only, not only painful criticism, but secondly, I want you to see that the criticism was continual. It was continual. In verse number seven, the Bible says, so it was year by year. Listen, 
This isn't something that just went on for a few days or a couple weeks. The Bible says, so it was year by year when Hannah went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. I mean, this went on year after year. I mean, whenever Hannah would go up to the house of God or the house, the house of the Lord, her, her rival, Panine, provoked her till, she, till Hannah, I mean, she would just weep and, and, and she couldn't even eat. I mean, can you imagine every time she went up to the house of God that she had to face Panine? And Panine was just kind of waiting in the shadows and to insult her and inflict pain. And it took a toll on Hannah. Look at the last part of verse number seven. So she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkana, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better than 10 sons? I think you'll agree that Hannah's plate was full with problems, unimaginable problems, unbearable problems. You've been there, haven't you? Some of you are dealing with problems right now like that. I, I've been there. But that leads me to the most important part of this message, and that is number three. I want you to see the response she gave. Let's look at the response that Hannah gave. I mean, what do you do when life throws you some problems, man, and just drops them right in your lap? I'm not talking about something a little bit or just, a, you know, your feelings were hurt a little bit. I'm talking about what do you do when life just dumps those problems straight in your lap? I put in your notes in that box. Your response is something you control. And it makes all the difference in the world. When problems come like that, and I mean when the problems are heavy and they come into our life, you can control one thing, and that's your response to the problems. Hannah responded, and you know what she did? She turned to the Lord in prayer. And I want us to look, you know, because I don't want just to, this just to be a nice thing. Okay, well, she prayed. I'm telling you, there are some things that come into our life. Listen, it is imperative to get this. That God allows those things to come in our life because he is, wants to drive us to him. Leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden, take your problems to the Lord and leave them there. Now, I want us to look. Let's dissect Hannah's prayer because there's three characteristic of Hannah's prayer. Here's the first one. Number one, and, and the reason I, I'm putting this in the message is because we ought to be praying the same way. Number one, she prayed openly. Look at verse number nine. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorstep of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she, Hannah, was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Now, the Hebrew word that God uses there is usually preceded by the raising of one's voice. Hagar raised her voice in the desert when the water ran out for little Ishmael in Genesis chapter 21. Esau lifted up his voice and wept after Isaac had given the blessings to Jacob in Genesis chapter 27. Jacob, lift, Jacob lifted up his voice and wept when he met Rachel in Genesis 29. The, the Hebrew text says that Hannah wept much, literally. In other words, she wept and she wept, like a double emphasis, because it suggests that there was great intensity 
in her prayer. In other words, Hannah didn't care who saw her. Not at all. Because you know why? She was getting down to business with God. Number two, she prayed openly. And number two, she prayed with commitment. Notice her prayer in verse number 11. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but I will. But, but will give your maidservant a male child. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. I mean, it was a prayer of commitment. She, she committed to the Lord. She said, Lord, if you'll just answer this prayer, if you'll, I, I, I will give you, if you give me this child, I'll give him to you all the days of his life. There were three basic laws of the Nazarites, the Nazarenes. Number one, they didn't drink wine or strong drink. They, number two, they didn't cut their head. And number three, they didn't touch a dead body. And she makes a vow and she prays committedly. Now let me just pause right here because we're talking about something that unfortunately there is a propensity in this flesh that we live in to almost pray flippantly when it comes to telling God what we will do. The Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes that when you make a vow, you keep that vow because you'd be a lot better off never to make that vow than to make it and break it. And so Hannah prays. She makes a vow to the Lord. She says, if you'll give me, if you'll give me this, this little boy, I'll make sure... I'll give him to you all the days of his life. But I want you to notice the third thing, and that is she prayed fervently. Verse number 12. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. There's a shift here in the prayer. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put, put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord. I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. You know, when you look at verse number 12, you know what you find out? She spent more time praying than she did weeping. Oh, how we want to feel sorry for ourselves. And there are times that it, it may grab you and you may, you, you, will, you will cry about something that has happened. Or that. But you know what? She prayed more time praying than she did crying about the horrific problems that she was dealing with. That word continued, that she continued praying. That word is translated multiplied or occasionally increased. In other words, Hannah multiplied, she increased, she intensified her prayers to the Lord. And by the way, it's the same word that God uses to describe how the floodwaters increased on the earth. And I mean her prayers. I mean, they are just coming to the Lord. In fact, verse 15 says that she poured out her soul to the Lord. You know, I remember when I was a boy, and I'm sure everyone listening to me, or most everyone has heard this, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And, and I can remember as a little kid, I didn't particularly like, like apples, but I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll eat an apple. And so I told my mom, I said, Mom, buy a bunch of apples, and apple a day keeps the doctor away. And, and you know what we do? We... Uh, we pray for this and we go on to something else or we pray for that and we go on to something else. But there are problems that God allows into our life that we just can't go on to something else. 
we keep that in our prayer with the Lord. I mean, fervent prayer, prayer with intensity, continual prayer. Well, Hannah's a great example. And as a result, you know what God did? God answered her prayers. Now, the reality is God always answers prayer, oftentimes not the way we want it. But we've got to, we've got to come to the Lord, and we've just got to pour our heart to the Lord, accept whatever God allows into our life. Well, Hannah poured out her heart to the Lord, and notice verse number 19. Then they rose up early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. You see, the problems that Hannah had in her life drove her to the Lord. I don't know what you're dealing with right now. Maybe there's not any problems that you're dealing with, but you will, and you probably have. But those problems that God allows to come into our life or brings into our life is to drive us to him like it did Hannah. And I don't know. I don't know what you're dealing with. But I can tell you there are two things that I'm absolutely confident of. Number one, there is a God. And number two, I'm not him. When problems come my way, I'm reminded of that. I remind myself, number one, there is a God, Ken. And number two, you're not God. In other words, why God does what he does, when God does what he does, where God does what he does, how God does what he does, is far beyond my comprehension. But every nanosecond of every day, I do know this, that God is faithful. And he is always faithful. Say the word always. Always faithful. These are dark days that we're living in. A pandemic, loss of jobs, uncertainty, what's happening on the world stage, what's happening on the political stage, the riots, I mean, these are, these are dark days that we're going through right now. But I'm absolutely 100% confident and convinced we still have God. And he's on the throne and he is in control. And he still heals problems. He still helps people. And he still hears prayers. You see, the problems of life, and I'll say it again, are designed to draw us to the Lord, not from Him. One of the most precious promises in all of the Bible is found in the book of Romans, chapter 8, and verse number 18. The Apostle Paul said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We're going to go through problems, and sometimes those problems are going to seemingly overwhelm us. But what God says is that whatever you go through, whatever you're going through, doesn't even compare to the beauty, to the glory, to the awesomeness of what God has reserved for us when we meet him face to face. But you know the greatest problem that anybody can face? In fact, we all face it. Some of you have properly dealt with the problem. But some of you maybe have not. 
And the greatest problem is this. There is nothing you can do on your own, spiritually speaking, to earn getting to heaven. The Bible says that you and I were born in this world a sinner by nature. And we can't work long enough. We can't work hard enough. We can't earn it. We can't do enough good things. There is nothing we can do. The only way to get to heaven, now listen carefully, the only way to get to heaven is to properly respond to that predicament. And the only proper response is to meet God on his terms and hear his terms. God says to you and me, I loved you so much that I did something for you that no one else could do. And it's the only way, if you accept it, if you receive it, it's the only way that you're going to spend eternity with me. God says, you were born a sinner. Spiritually speaking, you are dead. And the wages of that sin is death. Not physical death, we're all going to die, but spiritual death. Hell. In other words, if, if a person doesn't do anything from the time they're born to the time they're die, they die, in order to deal with their sin, they go straight to hell. But the Bible says this, the wages of sin is death, but, and here it is, the gift of God is eternal life through one way, through Jesus Christ our Lord. What God says is this, I loved you so much that I sent my son into this world and he died on a cross and he paid the penalty of your sin. He shed his blood that your sin could be forgiven. And what God says, there's only one response that's proper. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, that if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In other words, if you believe, listen carefully, if you believe that Christ died on a cross for you, that he was buried, that he rose from the dead, if you believe that, I'm not just talking about a, in your mind, I had a mental assent to that truth until I was 26 years of age. But at 26 years of age, you know what I did? I properly responded to that reality. And I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life, forgive me of my sin, and I received him as my Savior. You see, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the only way anyone gets to heaven is to properly respond to the sinful condition they're born with. But if you do, and if you will, God will forgive you of your sin, and he'll bring you into his forever family. You can do that today. I mean, right now, you could just say, God, have mercy on me. I believe that you sent Jesus to die on a cross for me. And I open my heart and receive him. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Give me eternal life. If you'll do that, he'll bring you into his forever family.